Hello and welcome to a brand new Terrace Podcast series. Uh, my name is Craig Anderson and I'm joined by my good friend Ewan Taylor. Hello Craig. And Ewan, we've been brought together here. This is something that I'd kind of suggested as an idea a few times and mm. never really got around to doing. But we're going to run a series essentially um, talking through the laws of the game. Uh, so basically yes. the, the background to everything that decides everything that goes on on the park as we watch a game of football, basically. Um, mm. to, to declare my own interest, I suppose, I, I was a referee for about four or five years. So did it when I was 17, when I was still at school. Did youth football in, in Ayrshire used to run the line a bit on um, junior games and refereed amateur football. And always actually enjoyed it. And, and the only reason I stopped was kind of family and personal commitment rather than anything other than that. It's a, it's a big undertaking to be mm. doing that. And the thought of doing it basically every Saturday for the next 30 years was not something that I really wanted at the time. So that was basically yeah. the only reason. Um, mm. You 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 have um, developed a reputation even within the, the Terrace uh-huh. podcast group chat at least as as being yes. very hard hard line on refereeing decisions. So what what motivates you to be the the person involved in this? Yeah, uh, yeah, well, yeah. I don't actually referee. I've never refereed an actual game of football. I just like to re referee games um, from the safety of my sofa or seat in the stadium. Um, yeah, so I suppose I mean I, I've got a, a bit of interest just because. I'm a lawyer, I suppose. So the word, the way thing, uh, you know, certain things are worded in the in the laws of the game, quite interests me. And then in terms of how, and I suppose it's all the it's all the extraneous stuff that comes in because I think the more you look at the laws, which we'll come on to, um, you know, when we go through them, I think the more you look at the laws, you realise how little of the, of the things that you might think are part of the laws aren't actually there. And it's actually the, the amount of interpretation, the, the amount of room for interpretation there is in there is, is quite vast. Um, so, so yeah, so that, that sort of interests me because actually, you know, the law is like that as well in, in, in real life. Um, but, uh, but yeah, certainly is the case in football. So um, I'm sure we'll, we'll come across uh, some, some laws like that. Yeah, and, and I think the, the point of all of this is that I think the majority of people who sit and watch football regularly basically fundamentally understand what you can and can't do in a game of football. Basically, mm. fundamentally understand 99% of what's going on. But there are things that pe- I think be- just become misconceptions about what rules mm. are. Um, and so I think part of what we're doing here is to kind of go through it. Also to kind of make it clear to people just how easily accessible all of this actually is. I think sometimes people think it's some sort of mi- mystical mm-hmm. um you know, mystical set of laws that only exist and, and referees have got the secret code and no one else has got it, but it's all it's all online, online. it's all there to look at and we'll um, kind of chat through that as well. But I thought mm. we'd start start at the start, which is where do the laws of the game actually come from? And do you mm. know this, Ewan? Uh, they come from IFAB. Yes, so IFAB, the International Football Association Board, which was set up in the 19th century initially by the four kind of UK Association, so the um, SFA being one of the four, along with the English FA, Welsh FA, and um, Irish FA, which is the the FA of Northern Ireland, and they are basically the kind of guardians of the laws of the game. Um, obviously, as the countries, I suppose, did the most for the development of the sport in the early days, and that kind of tradition is, I guess, being maintained because now essentially IFAB is, is obviously much more formalised, but. There are eight seats on the board of IFAB. Four of them come from those four FAs. So Ian Maxwell is one of the representatives on that at the moment. Um, and whoever the SFA chief executive is, basically. And then the other four come from FIFA, so come representatives nominated by them. So there's this kind of half and half balance between the, the UK FAs and FIFA, essentially, on that. And the laws of the game aren't static. They get updated every year. So IFAB have, as we all know, and indeed, but mm. um, IFAB have these meetings every year and they obviously decide what, what stays in and what doesn't. And they do tend to actually be quite good at communicating the changes. I would say the negative is the proposed changes often get leaked and talked about as if they've already happened. The most recent example being this blue card thing. Yeah. Um, that, that was never actually, like the way it's presented is as if this has been voting mm-hmm. through rather than they're talking about it and they're maybe thinking about having a trial of it which is essentially what the 
the upshot was at the time. Yeah. So I think one of the other things to be careful of with laws of the game in general is like to be aware of your sources, I suppose. Um, mm. And hopefully this will become a very useful source. But it's also true that this will immediately be dated because we are recording this in February 2024. IFAB, I think, are meeting again. It's in Scotland this year, which always means that you get to see like um, Infantino or whoever it is, like turning up at, you know, it's usually like Cove Rangers or Breaking yes. City or something um, for some reason, because um, they obviously go to a game of football while they're here. But they'll vote on some changes which will come through for, for next season, etc. And that happens on a yearly basis. Um, and then what we can do is look, and I'm, I'm going to share my screen with you, you, and potentially if the technology allows this may be visible on the YouTube eventually as well. Basically just going to run through the laws of the game, and that sounds really boring, but what we will obviously see as we go is each law will have some stories or some input or some intervention, but it's all on mm. their website. Just type IFAB laws of the game into Google or any other search engine and you have immediate access to the full set of the laws of the game. And this bit I always find quite interesting, um, which is at the start. So when you were a referee, you used to get this as a book. Basically, I'm sure the book still exists. Um, and it would talk about this philosophy and spirit of the game and why they exist and the spirit of the game and the importance of the human input and the fact that laws are subjective and so on. And then it explicitly tells you the laws can't deal with every possible situation and therefore <laughs> the referee has to make decisions which are in the spirit of the game. So <laughs> that in itself obviously is something that, I mean, I, I agree with fundamentally. I don't think you can legislate for everything that's going to happen on a football pitch, <laughs> but it does also lead obviously to situations where there's not a right decision to make almost. <laughs> Yeah. And I don't know from a legal perspective, you and Paul, the law is similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, and that's the, you know, well, you, you get different um, schools of uh, judicial thought on that. Um, and some people are very literal. I mean, that, that's what you sort of, <clears throat> maybe the most famous sort of example of that legally would be um, in terms of the Supreme Court in America. Like, you get some that literalist. Um, judges who, you know, it's like whatever it says in the constitution, you take it, you know, you take it very, very literally. Um, even though you know that was the constitution was written whenever it was seventeen hundreds, um, and uh, and you cannot deviate from that because that's what it says. Whereas you get other ones who have a bit more sort of a propulsive approach, I suppose, where you saying, well, what was actually what was the intention here, and and you know, can we look beyond the um, you know, what's what's uh, literally written down. Um, into what, what was the intention of the of the, um, you know, the people that, that made this this law in the first place, um, and which is sort of towards the, the year with the, the spirit of the game, and it's yeah, it's quite you know it obviously says you know what would what would football want expect or slash expect. I, mean, I think Howard Webb actually said that recently on you know one of these I think it was the one he does with Michael Owen where he sort of tries to stand behind <clears throat> some of the um, the bar decisions that are made down south, and I'm sure he said that with. I can't remember what the incident was, but he said you know, the game would expect a red card in that situation. Which, yeah, is, and and I, which, I, which I actually found, I was like, that's quite a weird way to phrase that, but it's, it's literally from <laughs> from the IFAB uh, guidance, is that that's why he said it that way. I think the, the, the time with this, what football would, would expect that comes in, and we'll talk about handball a lot later on, was the, the fairly recent rule change mm. about the ball, if, if the ball rebounds off someone's arm and goes into the net, for example, even if it's not deliberate, being not being given as a goal, that what football would expect was uh, was a big mm. justification of that. Now, I think yeah. there is sometimes an argument that what football expects is um, entirely unrealistic, and um, so there there are question marks about that. But I suppose I'm generally in favour of this idea of the spirit of the game, and I think we've deviated a bit too much from that because people are now just desperate for everything to be black and white, despite mm. it not being possible. I yes. don't. I don't want in the discussion that we're having about these because I want it to try and be as factual as possible, and and I'll try. I'll give opinions, but I'll try to obviously clearly signpost what is an opinion and what is um is not. But mm. I think part of the 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 fankle that I think football in general has got itself into it has been trying too much to respond to criticism and trying to respond too much to people being unhappy at being wronged, where. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes I think people just need to grow up. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, you could say that for many walks of life, but certainly true in football. Um, and yeah, I mean, I th- obviously, uh, you know, I think VAR has, has been a, uh, you can't really ignore the impact that's had on the interpretation of the laws. Obviously, most almost all laws haven't changed since VAR has been introduced, but um, you know, some of them have. And there's, I think there's definitely a, a move towards trying to make things more black and white and trying to make things more predictable, which is actually, in my view, Ma- and possibly as well, Craig, massively away from the the point of the spirit of the um of the laws, and I think that's it's the handball is probably the worst example of that for me in terms of how that's um we'll obviously come on to that in, in more detail, but you know, we've gone so far away from uh, you know a handball that would actually you know, affect the game, and now it's almost like sort of penalty pinball in the in the box and it, you could hit a hand uh, and people are just started to sort of accept those being given as penalties now which i i don't think is a good thing um but uh but yeah it's uh, i think that's an example where you know the, the game is is and, and the laws themselves are sort of adapting to to var which is you know fundamentally you know, it's the biggest change in in the interpretation of, of of the laws of the game that there has been in the history of football and, and I think part of that, you, you mentioned kind of that as being, that you know, VAR and, and the, that being involved as being one of the the driving forces behind it, but it's probably even before that came in and it's their kind mm. of linked is just the, the the fact there are more cameras and more angles and stuff I means you can, it, it used to be even if there was highlights, you know, it was maybe one camera for the side of the pitch or two if you were lucky and most mostly a decision couldn't be overanalyzed. Um, so basically, it was everyone talking about their view, but I think a lot, a lot of the discussion. Just, just come back to what you said as well before we move on um, about the different interpretations of the law in the legal sense, and the people taking things literally, and people taking things in a kind of more practical sense. Mm. Applies to referees too. I mean, every referee. Mm. And this is something that's obviously overlooked. Referees are not this monolithic block of people. Um, if you ever go, I, as I say, I used to train um, at the Usher referees and, and there was a bunch of us and, and they were a good bunch of people and got on with most of them. But if you were chatting about anything with them, there were, there were people from all walks of life and people with all different interpretations of the sport and people with different mm. interpretations of what the job of a referee was. And it's unrealistic to expect that every single individual will look at the same decision and, and make the same this de- de- like look at the same incident and make the same decision even mm-hmm. even if they're fully qualified referees with twenty years of experience under the belt and with full knowledge of the laws of the game, it doesn't mean they're going to agree. And we've seen that recently with the kind of panel that was set up to kind of review VR mm-hmm. decisions because you've now got yeah. a referee on the pitch who albeit is maybe only seen it live. You've got the people in the VR room who are watching it on video and you've got this panel who are kind of looking at it afterwards. And in many mm-hmm. cases, they're not agreeing with each other. Yeah. And that's being seen as a big issue. But it's to me, it's just natural. It's natural that if you show someone a tackle, we have on the podcast every week, someone's like, I think that was a red card. Someone's like, I don't <laughs> think it was. And okay, we can, we can argue that the more qualified you are, maybe the more you tend to align, but there are just many decisions where mm-hmm. there just simply isn't a, most decisions, there, is, there simply isn't a definite correct answer. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I think the rest, the rest of this section just talks about um, some of the changes I've made recently. So like, there's meant to be about player safety and then they've identified that they've got, they've tried to got, get a simplified version of the laws of the game as well. Um, but that's not really that interesting. Um, and then there's stuff about these notes and modifications, and these are basically unofficial versions of the laws of the game, which are um, are, are not unofficial, but are used kind of for th- like um, lower levels of the game, where perhaps there are differences. For example, for kids' football, you have smaller goals, or for uh, youth football, you might have different sizes of pitches, or for older, for veteran football, the pitch games might be shorter, there might be smaller balls, etc. I don't think it's really worth talking about that, because these are mm. not really related to the elite level f- football. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm literally even talking about, uh, you know, Scottish League 2 as being the elite level at this point. I just mean it's yes. not grassroots football. 
So I think what we can do is just crack straight on to the laws. And as you, um, mm. some people will be aware and some people will not, there are 17 laws of the game. And it's fair to say that they are not all equal in terms of their levels of kind of um, importance or what they contain, because mm. we're going to go through these laws one by one. And we were chatting about this before we, we put the episodes together. Um some of these laws will not take very long to cover, um, and some mm. of the early ones are very much in in that um, in that mold. Whereas when you start to get to laws about offside or fouls and misconduct, fouls mm. and misconduct law twelve basically contains everything to do with every single type of foul. What are yellow cards? What are red cards? And everything associated to that. You can imagine that one is a lot bigger than some of the laws we're going to talk about just now which are about um, how big the ball should be. Hmm. Um, now, of course, you need to have that law. You need to have all yes. of them. But I, I do think um, perhaps Law 12 could be at least subdivided um, a little bit because it feels <laughs> like you've got, you're have got you given equal value when you number them like this to uh, to that as to some of the ones we're going to start off talking about. But, of course, hmm. you, you do need to go with all of these. 